Good morning, Radiate family. Good morning, good morning. Happy Sunday. Happy September. We are celebrating our anniversary this month. So wherever you are, if you are with us in the sanctuary or you are tuning in virtually, we ask that you just pray with us as we thank God for this morning and as we get ready to worship him. Lord, thank you for where you have brought us, God. Thank you, Lord, that you speak to us. Thank you, God, that you show us, Lord, the way, God. Thank you, Lord, that this morning we are here in a spirit of celebration, Lord, not just for all that you have done for us, God, but for who you are this morning, Lord. We thank you, God, that we are able to be here today, God, whether physically here in the sanctuary or tuning in from somewhere else, God. We thank you that you brought us here today, Lord. We ask that as we worship you, God, as we go through the service today, God, that you would speak to us that you would make your presence known to us this morning, God, that if we're seeking answers this morning, Lord, that you will answer. God, we thank you, Lord. We love you, God. We are just in awe of your provision, Lord, of your love. And we ask, God, that as we worship you this morning, we just be filled with joy and gratitude, Lord. We thank you, God. We thank you, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Wherever you are today, celebrate and worship with us this morning, amen. So I don't know about you, but I'm here for him. I'm here for him, I'm removing everything else. So let's give him the praise that he deserves. Wherever you are, jump up, clap your hands, and remind him that you're here for him.
Amen. Amen. We are so grateful that he will not fail us. Amen. Thank you so much to the worship team. Um, that was a beautiful, beautiful time in worship. And we are so thankful um, for you, for you coming here today, whether you are in the sanctuary, whether you are online, welcome. This is Radiate at Spring Valley Church of the Nazarene. My name is Vanessa Latouche, and I am your service host. It is September. Happy September, everybody. This is our anniversary month here at Radiate. So thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Happy Sunday. If you are online, we encourage you to interact with one another on our live chat. We encourage you to just chat it up, say hello to us, say good morning, interact with the service. Um, this morning, um, I just want to, again, as I said before, it is our anniversary month. So this month we will be having guest speakers. We will be um, having a theme called Release and Expectation. And we're just so excited to be able to um, hear what God has to say to us in this very special anniversary month as we celebrate three years of Radiate. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask our pastor and senior ministry leader, Lionel Latouche, to lead us in our communal prayer and our communion this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. It's, it's a pleasure to be back with you today. Uh, my family and I have been away for two weeks as we celebrated the last few weeks of vacation. Um, and uh, I'm glad to be back in the house of the Lord, back to be, be in fellowship with y'all that are here back to being back at home, whether on your TVs or phone or iPad, wherever you are. It's a pleasure to be with you. We're going to pray uh, right now and go before the Lord. Uh, and uh, what I want for you to do right now is just uh, have a spirit of thankfulness, of gratitude. Um, if you are in a place right now where um, whatever, whatever place or state that you find yourself in, thank you, whatever state you find yourself in, um, you have the ability to be thankful, to be grateful. Um, and we are called to give thanks with a grateful heart. And let's go before the Lord and, and do that in this moment. Father God, we come before your throne and we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you, Lord, for being with us today. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, Father. Thank you, Lord, for uh, being constant. God, today on this beautiful Sunday morning, Lord, we just come before you and we say thank you. Lord, on other uh, Sundays, sometimes we bring requests before you, Father God, and, um, and we bring our needs before you. And Lord, we know that we can do that at any point. But today, Lord, we just want to say thank you. There's something really valuable when we can just come before your throne and say, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for being ever present in our lives. God, we give you all the glory and all the honor and the praise. We thank you for keeping it all together, Lord. Even when it feels like things are, have fallen apart, Lord, we acknowledge and recognize that if you weren't in the midst of it all, Lord, what looks bad would probably just be worse. And we thank you for intervening on our behalf, Father God, in the times where we didn't know you have. And we thank you for the, for, the, for the chances and the times where you have shown up and it was clear that, God, you were on our side. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you for providing. We thank you for meeting our needs, Lord. We thank you for fellowship this morning, God, being able to be with one another. We thank you, Father God, that as we walk in your will, Lord, you lay out the steps of what it is you want us to live, Father God, how you want us to live and who you want us to be. We thank you that you hold the plan in your hands, Father God. We thank you that you know all things, Father. We thank you that you love us. Even when we fail, even when we mess up, even when we make mistakes, you still love us. We love you and honor you, Father God. We bless you, we praise you. Thank you for being God. Thank you for being Jehovah, Elohim, Adonai. We thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray. 
wherever you are, we are going to partake in Holy Communion this morning. If you are home, you have the opportunity to grab your communion. Um, if you're home, grab a piece of bread, water, some juice, crackers, wheat thins, saltines, whatever it is that you have. You're in the sanctuary and you want to take uh, partake with us. We have the opportunity to do so this morning. Uh, if you are uh, going to do so as, as you grab your elements, we're going to give you about 10 seconds, 15 seconds to run into your cupboard and grab what you need as we go before the Lord. And as you do that, just pray a silent prayer to yourself. If there's unforgiveness that you have, if there's forgiveness that you need, if there's a, a, a need for reconciliation, whether it's relational, emotional, psychological, or mental, just go before the Lord and say, hey, God, this is me, and I'm bringing this to you before I go before you and, and, and take this holy sacrament together. Father, we take these elements, this bread and this wine or juice, Father, and we bring it before you, Father. We bless it, Father God. And we partake in this communion to remember the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, Lord. Let us remember and let us be moved by the sacrifice of his body and blood. And as we take together, Father God, let us consecrate ourselves before you and join together in fellowship with other believers. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the night before Jesus was crucified, he went up with his disciples and he took a piece of bread and he said, this is my body and he broke it. He said, my body that will be broken. Jesus' body was broken on our behalf punishment of sin that we should have endured, Jesus' body endured it for us. And that breaking of the bread represents the breaking of his body is symbolic. So when you take it this morning, remember that Jesus suffered so that you and I could be debt free. And he went to his disciples and he said, this is my body, eat it in remembrance of me. So we too this morning partake of his body and remembering the sacrifice that he made. And then he had a cup of wine. And he went to his disciples and said, this is my blood, blood that is shed for you. Jesus' blood wipes clean the sins of yesterday, the sins of today, and the sins of tomorrow. And renders us pure in the sight of God. And he said, drink this in remembrance of me. So this morning, we also drink as rem in remembrance of the shedding of his blood that renders us pure in front of the sight of God and restores us back into relationship with him. Let us drink of the cup. Father, we thank you for this holy sacrament that we do together, whether we're in the sanctuary or somewhere else, Father God. We do this in remembrance of you, in remembrance of your son, the sacrifice that he made so that we can be in relationship with you. We bless you, we honor you, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 It is always such a blessing when we can partake in just honoring God by remembering what he did for us, by remembering how he physically, emotionally, mentally endured that pain, shed his blood, his body was broken so that we could be free. And we're so thankful for that this morning. We're so thankful that God shows up we're so thankful that God speaks to us right at the right time. We're so thankful that he guides our path and that he lights our path. As we celebrate three years for Radiate, I just want to acknowledge how God has done that for this service, for this church. 
I want to acknowledge all the people who have been there with us from day one who have been either tuning in through the pandemic and the lockdown or been here with us in the service or have volunteered. Just everybody who has made this service possible, who have partnered with us in prayer. We're so, so thankful. And it is our anniversary month. It is a special time for us to celebrate. And for those of you who are members here, I'm sure that there is regular, you know, tithing that's happening. And I want to just encourage you as a, as a gift to radiate or as an um, honor to radiate, pray on or meditate on how you could give, whether, again, it is financially, whether it is just support-wise, giving of your time, of your prayers, but think about it in a very special way as we celebrate our birthday, right? The birth of Radiate. Um, if it means that you would like to partner with us financially, you can visit um, springvalleychurchthenazarene.org slash give. You can also scan this QR code um, if you'd like to pay through PayPal. It is, it is an honor for any time that we see that people have given of their very, very, you know, hard-earned money and have sacrificed that for the purposes of the Lord's work. We're, we're humbled by that. So we thank you, um, anybody who's able to give, however much you're able to give. It's about your heart when you're giving. All right, so this morning as we get ready for our word and our new theme for the month, which is um, release and expectation, we're going to read in Ephesians chapter 3. You can follow along verses 14 through 21 on the screen or in your Bibles. I bow in prayer to the Father because of my work among you. From the Father, every family in heaven and on earth gets its name. I pray that he will use his glorious riches to make you strong. May his Holy Spirit give you his power deep down inside you. Then Christ will live in your hearts because you believe in him. And I pray that your love will have deep roots. I pray that it will have a strong foundation. May you have power together with all the Lord's holy people to understand Christ's love. May you know how wide and long and high and deep it is. And may you know his love even though it can't be known completely. Then you will be filled with everything God has for you. God is able to do far more than we could ever ask for or imagine. He does everything by his power that is working in us. Give him glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Give him glory through all time and forever and ever. Amen. That is the word of the Lord. I'm excited. I'm excited for what today's word will bring, given that scripture that we read. Super powerful, really encouraging. I'm excited for this theme this month. I'm excited that it is September. I'm excited that it is football season. There is a lot happening. Um, and September is always a very joyful time here at Radiate and in our household. Um, once again, I just want to remind all of you, if you've missed any of our services, if you'd like to listen in on something again, maybe it was very impactful for you, you can go on um, any of your podcast players that you prefer. The name of our channel is um, Radiant Collective at Spring Valley Church of the Nazarene, and you can refresh yourself or listen to something for the first time. Um, at this time, I'm going to invite our pastor and senior ministry leader up again, Lionel Latouche, so that he can lead us in today's word. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Like Vanessa said, we are celebrating three years this month. I am so excited uh, to be celebrating with you all, and I believe what, that God is going to speak to all of us in a really profound way. Looking forward to what's going to take place uh, this month. Like Vanessa said, too, as well, we, we are in September. I don't know if anybody notices yet, but the nights are already getting very cold, right? And even the mornings are a little bit chilly. Like, we're feeling, we're feeling that fall is coming. I don't know about y'all as well, but fall is, has grown to be my second favorite season uh, just because hoodies, right? And we call fall hoodie season. I'm really looking forward to the next few months. 
uh, and enjoying this time with family and friends. Uh, and, and Vanessa said this before, uh, every September, as we celebrate God working in us and through us to be impactful in the lives of our community, um, we have a theme, and we take the entire month to develop that theme. Just so you know, we continue that theme through that entire year, from September to September, and it becomes the undercurrent of what God is doing in the lives of us here at Spring Valley Church of Nazarene and, and at Radiate. And as we already uh, uh, had articulated, the theme for this year is release and expectation. Release and expectation. And it comes directly from Ephesians 3.20, which many of you have already known when it says in the old school version says, now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. And I know it as now unto him that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask or think according to his work, his power that is at work within us. What we are doing is acknowledging the presence and power that we experience in God by being in relationship with Jesus and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And because of this, we fervently and wholeheartedly believe that if we are faithful to God, he is much able, he is able to do much more than we can ever ask or think. All right? He's able to do much more than we can ever ask or think, which means you don't even know what you can conceptualize. You didn't even know that you can conceptualize it. You ain't even know that you can ask for it. And God is saying, I'm going to do far beyond what your even wildest dreams would be if you are walking in accordance with me. And all month long, you will hear from speakers that ground us in this notion, in this belief, right, in this foundation, that if we believe and if we are walking in tandem with the Holy Spirit, God is going to do exceedingly and abundantly more. He is able to do it. And our God is more than able to go above and beyond. It reminds me of that song. It's about, what, 15 years old now, but God is able to do just what he said he would do. He's going to fulfill every promise to you. Don't give up on God. Because he won't give up on you. He's able. That's right out of, right out of Ephesians 3.20. I mean, the verse goes exceedingly, abundantly, above all. All you can ask or think. Like, they, the, the person who wrote it didn't have to work too hard, right? They, they opened the scripture and they wrote the song. In connection to this verse, we need to give you a little bit of theology today. So, today is going to be part, like, Preaching, part teaching, slash Bible study-ish, right? I want you to understand what we mean when God says he is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or think according to his power that is at work within us. If God is able to do much more, what does it mean for us in the now? You see, God is able to do much more, which is present but also future tense, that lends us to something in the here and the right now. The title of today's message is, Now for what is soon to come. Now for what is soon to come. How do we even begin to orient ourselves, position ourselves in a way that creates space for God to do exceedingly and abundantly more? We have to set that stage today. We have to create a foundation of that understanding of just what our God will do if we give him the space to do it. Let's embark on this month-long journey starting today together. So the writer of Ephesians is Paul, the Apostle Paul. And Paul is the writer of many of the epistles or the letters, right, from Acts all the way through trying to remember the last book, I believe Colossians, right? Um, all the way through, uh, yes, Colossians, Philippians, Colossians, right? Um, all the way through there, Paul has written all these letters and letters to people, uh, to churches, people in the church. 
And this letter, Paul is writing to the people in the church of Ephesus. This letter is presumed to be written sometime between 60 and 62 AD. And when I say letter, the book of Ephesians, the epistle of Ephesians. Now, it's important to note that Paul had spent significant time in the region of Ephesus. Ephesus is located today in what is considered modern-day Turkey. And at that time that the letter is presumed to be written, it was seen as a political, economical, and intellectual center point during that time. It was like a hub, right? You know how in modern-day talk, right, whenever... <laughs> Whenever we talk about Haitians, right, when Haitians talk about the United States, they talk about three things in the United States. New York City, Boston, Miami, Miami, right? When we talk about, even when we talk about states, most of us don't say Texas. We say Dallas, Texas, Austin, Texas, Houston, Texas, Orlando, Florida, Los Angeles, California, right? Chicago, Illinois. There's a reason why we do that. Those places are often economical, sociological, intellectual center points or hubs within those particular regions. This was Ephesus. What we know about Ephesus additionally is that there was a large presence of Greek and Roman gods that were worshipped in their respective temples. Paul goes to Ephesus, and, and the scripture says that he spends about two years. That's a long time. Two years on a missions, on missions work where he is able to, to, to share the gospel of Jesus to many people who lived in Ephesus. Now, sometime after that moment, Paul leaves Ephesus, and he's imprisoned by the Roman Empire. So what we believe and what we understand is that Paul is writing this letter while he is in prison. And when we read the whole book of Ephesians, there is a flow that what we observe. Paul starts the books of Ephesians, specifically chapter 1 and chapter 3, outlining the gospel story outlining the beauty and the mystery of Jesus, him coming down, and the power of the Holy Spirit. He elevates the previous separation between Jewish people, the people that were previously in covenant with God prior to Jesus coming down and reconciling us back with God, and the Gentile people, those who were non-Jewish or culturally and religiously did not know God. Within this story, Paul elevates God's desire to unify his creation, both Jewish and Gentile or non-Jewish, and bring them in as one family. That unifying work is done through Jesus' saving work of grace on the cross and the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So just to make sure you understand what we're saying here, the first three chapters says, God, uh, Jesus, God sent Jesus down to unify all people under a, new law, under a new law, under a new tenet, under a new work, whether they were Jewish or non-Jewish, and to make them all one people. That was God's desire, and empower them by the Holy Spirit. In chapters 4 through 6, Paul elevates the importance of believers walking in that unity while still being individuals within the kingdom. In short, what that means is he works, he works to identify how unity does not mean uniformity and that each member of the body of Christ has a role and responsibility as followers in that body. This chapter 3 that we've chosen is the unifying bridge between recognizing the gospel story and then recognizing our part in that story, okay? And in, chapter, in this chapter, Paul highlights the mystery of Christ through the gospel. Now, this mystery of the gospel can sound a little bit confusing. I'll be honest, when I first understood this mystery of the gospel thing, I'm like, what, what, what you talking about? What you mean mystery of the gospel? Like, 
this sounds like some sorcery weirdness. I don't understand what you're talking about. But in short, Paul describes it, and he says, basically, the mystery of the gospel, so we can understand, we're going to read it. You can read it in Ephesians 3, verse 5 and 6. And he says, the mystery was not made known to people of other times, but now the Holy Spirit has made the mystery known to God's holy apostles and prophets. Here is the mystery. Because of the good news, the gospel, God's promises are for Gentiles as well as for Jews. Both groups are part of one body. They share in the promise. It belongs to them because they belong to Jesus Christ. In short, the mystery of the gospel is about the power of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. The gospel takes these two groups that were separated, the Jewish and non-Jewish people, and because of the power of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit, both of these groups are unified. And now because of Jesus, everyone has access to the power or to the promise of God. That promise of God is first being reconciled back into relationship through Jesus, uh, uh, with God through Jesus. And second, the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. That's the promise of God. That's the promise. So to summarize, I told you it's a bit of theology this morning. All people, whether Jew or Gentile, now have access to the fulfillment of God's prop- prophecy or God's promise through his son Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. It's to sum it all up. Paul highlights the fulfillment of this promise in Ephesians 3, verse 20. God is able to do far more than we can ever ask for or imagine. He does everything by, the, by his power that is working within us. Now, we need context if we're truly going to understand Ephesians 3, verse 20. And today, I, I want to focus in a little bit on Paul here. When we go back to verse 13, something sticks out for us to really, like, soak up. Listen to what verse 13 says. So here is what I'm asking you to do. Don't lose hope because I am suffering for you. It will lead to the time when God will give you his glory. Hold up. Time out. Wait a minute. Flag on the play. Paul, who spent time preaching the gospel in Ephesus for almost two years, where many people came to understand him, again, is the writer of this letter. Because of the work that he did in Ephesus, he is arrested by the Roman Empire. He is oppressed by the government because of the impact and influence of Christianity and the noise that it is making throughout the region of the empire. Paul is in prison writing this powerful letter of God, doing exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask for. He's locked up. Locked up. Because of the faith that Paul had in the mystery of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul was able to see the potential of what would be even in the midst of his current situation. The vision of the fulfillment of the promise of God didn't seem to line up with his current circumstances. This redeemed, unified, glorious church that Paul outlined in chapters 1 through 3 and gets to in verse 20 saying God is going to do so much more with you according to the power of the Holy Spirit that's working within us. That sounds incredible. But he's saying this as he finds himself on a cold, dark, damp, small prison floor in a cell, chained up. It makes me think of us. As we see the possibility of what can happen, of what God is going to do, or what God has said he will do, 
we survey where we are and our circumstances don't really line up with the promise of Ephesians 3 verse 20. There's an aspect of things looking grim and things looking incomplete. And we ask ourselves, how can the God of immeasurably more do more in the midst of deficiency, division, uncertainty, and peril? And if we're going to be real for a second, I'm going to be honest with you. This is something that I've even had to explore here. We believe that through the work of what's going on here in our church, we believe that people are coming to the knowledge of what it is to know Jesus and make sense of what it means to walk with him in a real tangible way. No fluffy stuff, no corny stuff, just real faith meeting real life, rooted, relevant, and real. That's what we, that's what we focus on. And yet there are moments where it feels like the God that does immeasurably more can't work through the confining, oppressive circumstances of right now. God, there's not enough money. God, there's not enough people. God, we don't have enough time. God, we don't have enough resources. God, we know what you say that you're going to do. And yet, when we look at our situation and circumstances, it kind of feels like we are Paul locked up behind a prison wall with minimal options, minimal possibilities. What about in your own life? When we think about God doing exceedingly and abundantly more than you can ask or think, perhaps you believe that, but then you look around and you're like, I don't understand how you're going to do this, God. God, I don't get it. Does it make sense to me? I don't understand when I'm really frustrated and, and, and I get in the moments where I don't understand. Sometimes I'll say in Creole, Baco Pan, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. How are you going to do more with all this nothingness? Even for the people of Ephesus, even though they found themselves as a growing, expanding group of body of believers, they were still in a metropolis area where they were far outnumbered by those who didn't believe God, far outnumbered by those who oppressed the work and the movement of the Christian faith at that time. And not only that, they found themselves at a place of disagreement as a church, because some of them, Jewish people, grew up in the faith or some knowledge of God, and others of them were Gentiles. They knew nothing of this God that they talk about. And now they're supposed to come together and make something, but it seems like things don't line up, things don't make sense. How are you going to do more with what we have, God? I'm reminded of the, the time that Jesus preaching to 5,000, and as he preaches to 5,000, the people say, Lord, I'm hungry. This morning I was driving here, and I didn't have breakfast this morning. I just had a little bit of coffee, and I didn't even finish my coffee. I still got most of it left in the car, and I walked into the church, and I just felt the hunger pain, and I said, man, I am hungry. The people of God that we're listening to God, are saying, Lord, we are hungry. And then the disciples come to Jesus and tell Jesus that, Lord, your people say that they are hungry. And God says, Jesus says, so feed them. And they say, Lord, how do you expect for us to feed them? All we got is five loaves and two fish. There are 5,000 people. What are you going to do with this state of deficiency? What are you going to do with this state of nothingness? What are you going to do with this state of not having enough? Remember, we preached earlier in the year about when we don't have enough. Remember that? 
This is why Paul says, don't lose hope. You see, as Paul is speaking about what is to come, he speaks into your right now in that very moment. And he says, don't lose hope. Recognizing that there's a glory that's on the other side that maybe hasn't actualized just yet, but it's sitting, waiting, gonna happen. It's almost like a rain cloud. Have you ever looked up in the sky and you've seen a rain cloud? And you know that there is a big storm, a big overflow, a big rush that is going to happen. But you see that as you look around, the ground around you is still dry. There is no rain falling. You see the actualization of rain falling, of overflow, of much more is up in the sky. You can see it, but it hasn't happened just yet. This is expectation. That is expectation. Expectation is not saying it is happening now. Expectation is not saying that it is going to happen in this moment. If the rain cloud opens up and water falls from the sky, I am not expecting rain. I am experiencing rain. There is the actualization of that water of overflow. Expectation rather says that there will be a shift in the future. You hear what I'm telling you this morning? Expectation says that in the here and now, I believe that something is going to come. That what is will no longer be. The expectation for the church of Ephesus that Paul is trying to create is that the church which is divided will no longer be because of the unifying power of Jesus that we experience through the Holy Spirit. You understand what I'm saying here? So then what does Paul say needs to happen in the here and now? He actually outlines this very clearly in this passage. And he gives us more in chapters 4 through 6, but he gives us a glimpse in chapter 3. And I want to point out three things in this text that Paul points out beautifully. As we are getting ready for God to fulfill his plan here on earth, here are the three things we need to do. The first is we need to love deeply. Verse 17 says, Then Christ will live in your hearts because you believe in him, and I pray your love will have deep roots. We are called to love, to continue to love deeply, even in the midst of uncertainty that we may be standing in. We are called to love each other deeply as the church, as the ecclesia. In addition, we are also called to love others who are not walking with Christ in the way that we are. We are called to love those who are Jew and Gentile. We are called to love those who know God and have yet to know God. And we are called to do so in a way that shows what God's love is. If we read the, the, the whole passage of chapter 3, we read verse 14 through 21, and it outlays, right? And I pray that you know how wide and how deep and how far the love of God is, even though you would never fully understand it. And once you know that love, you are able to express that love to other people in a way that they can feel that. That is what the first point of this, this first step of this should be. We are called to love deeply. We've always established here that folks will know Christ, not by what we say, but by what we do. And that is in the way that we love. Secondly, the next thing that needs to happen is division must cease. Division ceases. Remember, in verse 6, it says, God's promises are for the Gentiles as well as they are for the Jews both groups are parties, or excuse me, are parts of one body. And I want to say this to you very, very clearly, and you might find this a little bit controversial, but I want you to understand what I mean by this. We have been taught in the church that only those who go to church, who know of God, have access to the promises of God. I want to tell you that that is incorrect. The availability of the promise of God is just as accessible. You hear what I'm saying? It's just as accessible for those who have yet to know God 
as it is as those who are already in relationship with God. If Jesus is the embodiment of the mystery of the promise of the gospel, we must believe that those who have known him forever and those who don't know him have equal access to Jesus. I'm not better because I've known Jesus for 25 years of my life. That don't make me better. I'm not better because I'm a pastor. That don't make me better. I'm not better because I can, I can recite scripture. That don't make me better. In fact, what I will tell you is those abilities, those, those traits, that history means that there's a greater accountability for me to be better. What I will say to you is this. What makes me better is not what I know, it is who I know, and that is Jesus. That's what makes me better. What makes and what will make other people better is not what they know, but who they know. It's Jesus. And that's just a decision that you make. That's simple. It's not about being, a, being in, the, in Christianity. It's not about being in church. It's about knowing Jesus. Additionally, what that means is that in the body of Christ, whether we are new or old, whether we are seasoned in the faith or we just accepted Christ this morning, whether we are old school, we do things in an old-fashioned way, or we are new school, we do things in our way, in our time. That unity is key and essential to God's will being done within us and through us, not uniformity. What do I mean by that? I don't need to look like you for God to do what he's going to do through me. I don't need to sound like you in order for God to move. I don't have to talk like you in order for what is to come to come. We may, be, we may have differences, even as a church body. You may love to wear your tie on Sunday morning. And I'm going to come in my kicks and my t-shirt. You may love to sing, great is thy faithfulness. And I may like to sing, he won't fail. You might come to church three times on Sunday and think that's what's right for you. And I might come for an hour and a half service and be like, yo, I'm good. I'm blessed. That doesn't make us different. Excuse me. That doesn't make us wrong. It makes us different. Some of this infighting needs to stop in order for this church to move to the place where God wants for it to go. The division between us needs to stop. The talking bad about each other needs to stop. If we truly want to see the promise of what God is bringing in the here and now, division must cease. And last but not least, approach God with freedom and without fear. Approach God with freedom and without fear. Paul says in verse 12, through him and through faith in him, we can approach God. We can come to him freely. We can come without fear. One of the things that I love is when I see children go up to their parents and ask them for things freely and without fear. You know, they, young children model this really well. Young children model this really well. They don't care about financial constraints. My, my kids don't care if I don't have $10 up to my name. If they want Wendy's, they want chicken nuggets and fries, guess what they say? I want chicken nuggets and fries. You see what I mean? <laughs> it, <laughs> it doesn't matter to them. This is actually a beautiful example. They're not worried about what service is going on. They're not worried about the social component. They hear chicken nuggets and fries, 
and they have the freedom and no fear to say, Daddy, I want chicken nuggets and fries. That's what I want right now. You see, part of the issue for us as well, and why we are not experiencing the soon to come, is that in the here and now, we are afraid to ask God. <laughs> Hear what I'm telling you this morning. We are afraid to approach God in the way that young children know how to do so well. Maybe because of the punishment that's going to come. Or the fear of punishment that we think we might go through if we ask. But scripture says for us to approach God freely. And when we approach him, to do so in faith. That's the here and now as we get ready for the future. Going before the Lord and say, God, my situation don't look great, but I'm going to approach you anyway. God, what I'm looking at doesn't necessarily make sense, but I'm going to approach you anyway. God, I can't seem to get some clarity on this thing. But you know what? I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to ask you without fear. That's living in the here and now. So we love deeply. The vision stops, and we approach God freely and without fear. Lately, I've been in a place where I've been meditating on this verse. And the reason why we chose this verse for this theme in this year is because of the meditation. God, gave the, God hit me over the head like three or four months ago and said, this is where I want you to go. And I'm like, all right, God, I'll do it. That God is able to exceedingly and abundantly do more than we can ask or think according to the, according to the power that is at work within us. And there have been moments where I have felt like Paul, where I am working hard to believe that in the midst of situations that don't make sense, that more glory is on the other side. And as of late, as I've continued to walk with the Lord, he's continued to impress upon me. Here are the things that I need for you to do in the here and the now. And some of it may involve some suffering, but you are going to see my glory on the other side. I want to say to you, and I want to impart this to you right now. Even in the midst of some suffering right now, there is glory on the other side. There is glory on the other side. Can we press into that spirit of expectation? Saying to ourselves, God, as we expect for you to do more in the future, I am ready to do things in the now. We are ready to take steps in the right now. As a church, in the midst of Spring Valley, a place that is bubbling and shifting and changing, and there are so, so many dynamics that are going forward. Are we able to love deeply? Are we willing to eliminate any thoughts or actions that cause division? So that the Holy Spirit can unify us as a church in this community. And are we willing and ready to approach God freely and without fear as we prepare for him to release based on holy expectation? I don't know about you, but I am ready for God to release something. I am ready for God to let something flood in our community. If you are in the same place, whether it's in your life, in your family, in our church, in your community, in your neighborhood, if you are ready for God to release something and you are in a place of expectation, I'm going to invite for you to pray with me. In a few moments. Now I want to be real with you. There's parts of this message that we are going to come back to. We may end up re-preaching this. Because there's another perspective of this message that we have to talk about. And I'm not going to reveal it now. But in soon, uh, soon God will reveal it. But what I want to just point out is as Paul clearly shows us that there is an expectation that we should have. Based upon the Holy Spirit. I want for us to have that expectation as well. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father God, I, I thank you for the opportunity that you've given us just to hear your word today and sit with what you have for us. God, 
Lord, we believe that there is something glorious to come. Something beautiful, Father God, in the here and in the, in the future. But God, you require us in the here and now to step up, to be present. Father God, you charge us with loving deeply. You charge us with ending division. You charge us with approaching you freely and without fear. Lord, as we meditate on, our, on, on Ephesians 3 verse 20 today, give us that spirit of expectation. So that way, God, as we prepare in the now, we can be ready for what you are going to bring. And what you will do will exceed any expectations, will be greater than anything that we could ever see or do. We believe this, we declare it, and we prepare for it. In the glorious name of your Son, Jesus, through the work of your Holy Spirit, we pray and all God's people said, Amen. 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 What a word. If you guys missed that today, any part of it at all, check it out on our streaming um, podcasts, right? Or you can go back on the streaming on YouTube and check it out. Thank you for everybody who joined us today here in the sanctuary as well as online for our first service of September as we celebrate our anniversary here at Radiate. We will be celebrating our anniversary throughout the entire month, and we just encourage you to join us here in person. Um, we will be having guest speakers throughout the month, and we just encourage you to be here as we celebrate three years of Radiate. If you are interested in getting uh, updates and you haven't already signed on for it, you can text SVRC to 84576 and receive updates. You can also follow us on social media. We are on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can tune in as always. We encourage you to our French and Haitian Creole service every Sunday at 11 a.m. following Radiate. We are so blessed. We are so thankful. We ask that you go and have an amazing week. We will see you back here next week for Radiate at 9.20 a.m. Have an amazing week and be blessed. Amen. <laughs>